Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today's game is going to be a bit of a classic. It was a 1990s, very early 1990s publication by the well-known game company Avalon Hill. And it's sometimes been described, including on the back of its own box, as a sister game to that company's very famous Upfront. Now, to those of you who've never heard of Upfront, it is a very, very interesting creation. It is a infantry combat game set in the Second World War, heavily driven by cards. And when it first appeared, this was very, very unusual. It exploded onto the scene in an era of uh, hex-based war games. And to, to have no map, and no overall situational awareness and everything driven by cards with a few u with some unit cards and a lot of markers was something very, very new. And of course, when um, the game I'm going to be showing you, which of course is Attack Sub, came out, most modern naval combat simulations, those that existed at the time, were very much hex and counter or sort of heavy-duty war games. Harpoon was around, um, to give you another example of a game which I have played. It's ultra, ultra detailed. This is the exact opposite, in a way. Now, why is it called a sister game to Upfront? Well, the reason is Attack Sub, like Upfront, relied very, very heavily, in fact exclusively, on a deck of action cards to drive the gameplay. Now, for a, for a subject as complicated as modern naval warfare, and I'm going to have to be careful what I say here because it was 1991 when this game came out, and while, you know, fogies like me like to think that 1991 is still present-day naval warfare, I'm afraid the world has moved on a tiny bit. But it was a, a complex subject to model, and anyone who's familiar with the aforementioned harpoon will know that that's a relatively realistic simulation of modern naval combat, but it's hugely dense, very, very detailed. Whereas, look at this. You have these cards, lovely graphics for the time. This was quite stylish. I mean, it looks dated now, but for the very end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, this was pretty cool. Um, but most of it's taken up by illustration. There's not that much information on the cards. It's very sparse. So, can, can a game like this actually claim to be a realistic simulation of submarine warfare at the, at, at the, you know, the very end of the Cold War? That it's made, most of its scenarios are set in the 1980s. Well, I bought this on a bit of a whim in 1997, 1998, thereabouts, and I have never regretted it, because although it's slightly out of my comfort zone in terms of period, from what I've understood, it's not only a very reasonable um, representation of submarine warfare at the height of the Cold War era, it, 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 it does it so simply. You get this wonderfully broad brush approach to the realities of modern submarine warfare that, that you, you're allowed to concentrate on your tactics and executing your plan and, you know, the, 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 the thrill of trying to find the enemy before he finds you. Uh, all of that is in this game. So what do you get inside the box? I mean, this looks like it should be a fairly, you know, fairly components-heavy box. It's not little. But in fact, less in this case is definitely more. You get the deck of action cards, which we've already had a glimpse of. I'll just give you a quick idea as to the anatomy of these. So very simply, and this is where the game's similar to Upfront, you have a random number at the centre of the card. Very often in the game you will draw cards from the deck to um, reference the random number. If it's a card that you have in your hand, the critical things you need to know are black text means you play it on your turn, red text means you can play it as a reaction during your enemy's turn, if you have both, then obviously it's a dual-use card, um, and that makes sense. I mean, the card like this, close, open range, you can either manoeuvre your submarine with it, or you can cancel an opponent's attempt to do so, if you can see them. And this is where this game shines, because submarine warfare, to those of us who have 
any inkling of what it's like, the modern day submariner's view is limited to what they can see in their control room. So it makes perfect sense that in a game like this, you don't need you you don't need a map. You you pretty much have your deck of cards and your imagination. There's just one last thing I'll mention: random hit results. Now, as one would expect with modern warfare, um, most results of a successful hit will be that the vessel is sunk. Um, there are some, um, some, there is some scope, sorry, for taking damage, non-lethal damage, but it's usually quite disastrous in nature. And the game's designer did admit that for the sake of, of getting a good game out of this, he'd been slightly optimistic with some vessel's damage ratings. But I don't think he's done anything wacky and wild. So just to show you a couple more cards, exactly the same format. That's purely a response card. Um, you never want to get those as random numbers. X is a failure. Whatever happens, it's bad news. So either your sonar or weapon systems will lock up and refuse to work or something. Or if you've got helicopters in play, if you're part of a surface force, that represents bad weather and they're forced to land. But that is a pure reaction card. Everything's in red. And here are two examples of cards you play during your turn. Pa active sonar to increase your, your um, fix upon an enemy's um, surface ship or submarine. And when you finally get a strong enough contact level, you can shoot a torpedo at them. Fairly straightforward, fairly simple. Now, of course, there's a lot of complexity going on because modern sub-warfare involves, of course, submarine-launched missiles and similar. All that has been accepted and it's been folded into the generic card system. So that may represent a Mark 48 torpedo or it might represent a harpoon missile. Either way, the end result is the same and you just go by the card's title, weapon lock on, you can fire. So you get the deck of cards, what else is there? Obviously, there's got to be something to differentiate the ships and the submarine, surely, because as we know now, there were certain technological differences between the navies of NATO and the United States and the navies of the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union that, that gave them a very distinctive feel. Um, certainly, the West was notably ahead of the Soviets for much of the 70s and 80s in terms of uh, the quality of their sonar. Um, the Soviets, um, their submarine arsenals ranged from serviceable relics from the 1950s all the way up to ultra-modern submarines with the latest they could incorporate into propulsion systems, weaponry, um, and even hull sheathing to try and reduce their sonar signature. And all of this is very cleverly folded and quite simplistically into the data cards that you are given. So in a scenario, a player will have one or more of these cards in front of them representing their force, and it could either be a surface ship or it could be a submarine. Now, most of the times you, you very often will, will play one or the other. It's very rare for you to have a submarine operating with a surface force in this game scenario, but it's not unknown. What you don't get are two surface forces on the same side, uh, uh, on opposing sides. This game does not model surface to surface combat or air to air combat. It's purely the interaction between submarines on one or both sides and the, um, their interaction with task forces specifically designed to hunt them. So here, going back to the USS Simpson, we have um, the graphic that shows she's capable of launching helicopters, and um, the, number, the number there is the endurance number that has to be um, drawn to make sure she can stay in the air. It's a very clever way of representing the vagaries of weather, fuel, Every time a helicopter takes an action, it has to make another check. So, of course, you might be out of sonar boys, you might be out of torpedoes, depending on what type of helicopter you are. 
you may have a very limited weapons tray. I really like the aesthetic of these because they're simple but again, for the 1991, quite attractive. So you get you get this graphic that could have come straight out of Jane's fighting ships, as well as the data about the vessel. But the real bits that you need for the game are your sensor rating, um, your weaponry rating, your contact level, um, your own um, detection value, and your electronic warfare defense rating. So the game gives you enough counters for you to fill all these boxes so you can track the status of your ships. So like I said earlier, if you are hit, most results will be a sunk. You're just taken out the game. Some simply damage you, but the damage is often severe enough to render you hors de combat. What is very interesting as a mechanic of this game is that you never have your own contact markers or uh, uh, on, on your own vessel. You, so you, you, you never track your enemy on your own contact sheet. It's their counters on you so that they can determine how good a sight they have of you. And that, that's, a, that's a slightly tricky one to get your head round when you first start playing this game. So, so none, of the, none of the little pips on this track will be yours, but you'll have a pretty good idea of who's after you. And it does mean that there's no closed hand information in this game. Every player can see each other's data cards, um, be it surface vessels or submarines. Now, just a quick look. If you see um, the quality of US sonar, they have a rating of three, which is pretty good for this game. They have the ability to have one helicopter in the air at one time. Their anti-submarine warfare rating is a bit weak, which is fair enough. I believe this class were mainly surface combatants with, with some uh, anti-submarine capability, the Oliver Hazard Perry class. And you see the same level of variation in submarines. So a hunter-killer, rather than an, a strategic missile boat, will be optimised for finding and sinking enemy vessels. Look at that sonar rating of five. That is formidable. And weapons rating of plus three versus um, surface ships and plus three versus submarines. The Los Angeles class are justifiably dangerous. Their biggest rivals in the game are actually the Soviet Victor III class, but I'll show you a Victor I because I've got it closer to hand here. So, as you can see, somewhat weaker sonar ratings and somewhat weaker weapon ratings. That's mainly to reflect that the, the fact that the Soviets never quite had a torpedo with detection systems as good as the US Mark 48, for example. Um, they never did quite develop um, decent towed arrays, sonar arrays in this period. And they never quite had an equivalent of the submarine deployed harpoon missile. So all of that is factored into this. Um, what they are is um, quieter. So you'll notice your basic Los Angeles has a detection rating of six. That's what the Soviets have to score to increase their detection level. Now, the, the Victor One, which is a slightly older model of hunter killer on the Soviet side, is as quiet as a Los Angeles. The Victor Three, which is also included in this game, has a detection value of seven. So by the late 1980s, uh, as is reflected in the game, the Soviets were drawing ahead in quietening their holes down. And these are just the tip of an iceberg of a wide range of surface ships, submarines, and the cards are double-sided, so you have an awful lot of options. You can create an almost limitless, almost limitless number of scenarios with the cards you have. And it's quite a delight to see with NATO that it's not just a US show. Um, the British are here too with the highly successful, and God do I feel old, recently retired Trafalgar class nuclear attack submarines. These are the most modern British submarine in the game, guys. So if you're looking for astutes, you won't, you won't find them in here. And lastly, you get the rule book. Now this has got to be one of the most impressive rule books I have ever seen. 
And it's not the graphics, it's the presentation of the rules. And despite the small print, it's their utter simplicity. This is an eight page booklet. Five pages and a smidge are taken up with the rules of the game. Um, another page and a smidge are taken up with scenarios and all the rest designers notes. That is it. So yes, this is a sister game to Upfront, but at the same time they could not be less alike. Compared to Upfront with its plethora of unit cards, um, loads of counters, subsets of rules to deal with different kinds of ordnance, all the things that make Upfront beautiful are absent in this game. But it's that absence that makes this game such a work of art, because in, in a really, really simplistic way, the capabilities of these near combatants from the Cold War period have been boiled down to something really quite manageable. And as I said earlier, what that means is you can concentrate on fighting your battle and not worrying about whether your ancient Phoenix 20 sonar set is up to the task at the same rate as whatever the British system might be. And there's no endless consultation of tables for weapon performance, cavitation. Detection is simply a matter of you play a card, let's say an active sonar, your enemy counters with a thermal layer to reduce your rating if they have a counter at all. Random number is drawn and added to your sonar rating and compared to their detection rating. Simple comparison of numbers, but it generates such a wonderful narrative. I've been playing this game fairly solidly since I bought it and it has never got tired. I'm never giving it away. Um, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself with the enthusiasm. Um, it's all very well to, to talk broadly about the components, um, but I'm sure you'd like to see the game in action. And I'm very happy to say I'm, I'm delighted to oblige. The next video, of course, will be the usual playthrough demonstration. So we'll reconvene with that. But in the meantime, thank you very much for joining me. It's always a pleasure to see you guys. And um, I hope I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.